we're a very breast conscious society and it's not like we're reconstructing a small toe or something like that. It's actually a, a major part of somebody, of a woman's anatomy in terms of how she feels about herself. The absence of a breast for many women, not all women, but for many women is a, a critical issue. It's also a reminder of the diagnosis of cancer. And uh, every time they look at themselves in the mirror, they're reminded again of that diagnosis. And I think what the reconstruction does, uh, it doesn't so much treat the cancer, but the patient you know, as a whole. Hi, how are you? Good. Good. Okay, so we're Ready for another uh, inflation here. How are things going? Let's good. have a look here. Really good. Okay. Now you can see that uh, Lori's had a, a mastectomy here. So what we did is we opened this up, the incision up. We put a tissue expander in underneath the muscle and the skin here. And you can see that we're now expanding nicely. Um, what you're seeing over here, in fact, is the filling port where we're going to inject through and there's a little plastic tube that goes from this little button back into the balloon which is sitting underneath here like that and expanding this skin and the scar outward. Now this uh, syringe looks uh, very large and scary but as uh, Lori knows this is not as bad because it's, it's just a small little prick through here. As I'm pushing that fluid in, it's uh, Lori's not feeling that, it's actually going into the um, through the little plastic tube from this button back into the tissue expander, which is sitting here. Once we've reached a um, point that uh, Lori's happy with the, and we're happy with the symmetry with the opposite side, then we can, uh, we'll, we'll start planning the second stage, which is uh, taking the expander out, putting in an implant and, and reconstructing the nipple at that time. It's uh, coming along very nicely. So, uh, do you have an appointment for uh, another inflation? Yep, two weeks from now. Two weeks? Okay, great. Excellent. That mitral valve thing over there. Mitral valve collapse. collapse. Do you yeah. usually take antibiotics? I don't take no. Oh, I do. When you go before, before the dentist? The dentist, yes. Great. Are you attending in there? I'll you? be in there, yeah, the whole time. So. Um, just, uh, I would like a nice warm blanket. And I have my many hands. of those oh, in the great. oven for you, so. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, let me just explain to you, Charlie, this is the second stage. As you know, the expanders are in there now. And what we'll do is take the expanders out through a small, just the same incision we used before. And then we'll replace it with a, a saline implant, uh, which we're going to fill to the size we talked about and we'll take the small skin graft from just down in the uh, upper thigh area, and uh, we'll just use the graft uh, for the areola. We'll take good care of her. Yeah. Okay. Good luck. Mm -hmm. Bye-bye. See you in a bit. Bye-bye. Yeah. Okay. I don't think uh, breast reconstruction is for everybody, but I think for many women, they it gives them a, a real uh, boost uh, to get back into their active lifestyle without having to worry about a prosthetic. This is the expander that we've uh, used to expand the, uh, the breast area. Initially, she just had a mastectomy, so there was a deficit of, of uh, skin. Tissue expanders are are commonly used in uh, different uh, parts of the body for different plastic surgery procedures and forms of reconstruction. Plastic surgery, the actual term, was actually invented long before the material plastic was invented. And uh, the term plastique is a French word to mold and to shape. And that's exactly what we do as plastic surgeons. I'm just inflating the uh, implant to its desired amount. Uh, as we're, uh, we now have 180 in there, this will be 240. I think that when you choose plastic surgery as a profession, a number of reasons for that. 
for me, it was, I think, my art background. In art, you, you tend to use your hands a lot, so that if you think of an idea of a, for a sculpture, it's, uh, the concept is in your mind, and then you have to transfer that through your hands to the medium. This is what we call the skate flap, which is a, just a technique for using this tissue which is available here. We free up the majority of the tissue but leave it attached in the center and then form a little tube out of it for the nipple. By taking a skin graft, the it tends to be a bit darker, which adds to the uh, pigment aspect of the areola that we're reconstructing. What I'm doing now is placing this screen graft onto the bed here. I'm just tacking it down. When I finished high school, I actually went into the Ontario College of Art and uh, from there went into medical illustrating. I was doing a series of drawings for uh, one of the orthopedic surgeons uh, at the Toronto General Hospital. And uh, he was short help, and he turned to me and he said, sample, scrub, which, of course, nowadays you could never do that, but uh, it actually got me in there holding sort of retractors. Uh, I was uh, absolutely fascinated with it. Nipple reconstruction is not really necessary in terms of the treatment of the cancer, but in terms of the patient's uh, Rehabilitation tends to be very important and very satisfying for the patient to have that back. They feel much more normal and uh, much more uh, whole in their, in their sense. I think that uh, the public's expectations or impressions of what a surgeon should be is certainly um, influenced by, by the media, ER shows and things like that. Uh, and there's no question, I think, that in surgery you need confidence to do what you're doing, but the best surgeons that I know don't have that godlike character or, or ego. These are uh, my sketchbooks, and I, I try to fill at least one of these up uh, a year, and it, it tends to be more of a visual diary than anything else. And I think it's that creative impulse in your hands, which also you find in surgery and in, and in music as well, that uh, you get a, a sense of satisfaction in, in producing something all the time. Every year I sort of do a when we're on holidays, I do a picture of a sort of a portrait of our family as it is, and the kids are getting bigger, and uh, so it's uh, it's good fun that way. That was good. You tired already, guy? Huh? You tired, <laughs> tired already? already. <laughs> the practice just began. Should be easier than the game, right? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, I'm just anyway. All our guys have been into the hospital at least once or twice. But uh, I know that uh, as they get older, they, they tend to ask, uh, you know, when they, they realize that sort of a little more about what I do and they sort of wonder how I do that. My daughter, who's 11, asked me one night, uh, you know, do you worry about the kind of surgery you're going to do the next day? So I told her, I don't really worry about it, but I think about it, and I'm, uh, and if it was something I was really worried about, I wouldn't be doing it. A surgeon cannot work in isolation. We need uh, great nurses, uh, we need uh, anesthetists. We rely a lot on our uh, residents and fellows as well. Dr. DeValley, uh, across from me, is uh, actually on the last, <laughs> the last day of her training uh, of a five-year uh, residency program in, in uh, plastic surgery. The thing that's special about Dr. Semple is um, the way that he approaches his patients and uh, the way that he manages them. It's been very um, instructive to work with him. And I want you to know that 
you know, we've already done the evaluation thing, so I don't. <laughs> She's totally free to I've say what she passed, wants. So yeah. <laughs> I can say that freely. He takes into consideration all aspects of the patient in terms of both their wants and needs, and he prepares them very well for surgery, again, both uh, physically and mentally, so that their expectations are met because they're very clear about what to expect. I think when you're dealing with cancer patients, there's no question that that has a, an effect on you. But I think from my own point of view, uh, you're in a position to, to help these people. So I'm taking somebody who's had a diagnosis of cancer and helping them back as much towards their previous life as possible. Um, now, uh, any questions about what we're going to do? In terms no, of I, don't, I don't think so. Think the that. patient uh, we're doing today, uh, Joanne, She's already had a mastectomy on one side uh, for previous uh, cancer, and she's now having a prophylactic mastectomy on the opposite side. So, in fact, we'll be reconstructing both breasts. Uh, so, you know, Dr. Lickley is working with us. She'll do the mastectomy, and uh, and at, under the, at the same time, or under the same anesthetic, we're going to do the reconstruction of both breasts. Today, um we're doing a, what they call a prophylactic mastectomy, which is a preventative mastectomy, because I have other lumps in my right breast, and they can't, the mammograms and ultrasounds aren't showing anything. Uh, and I really don't want to go there again and wait and see, and maybe not be as lucky next time. So that's really what's brought me to today. Joanne was amazing. Like she was very strong about it, and basically, I I, th I think we all took the position of saying, "Whatever you want to do, Joanne, do." Where the uh, the new breast is going to sit. This particular operation, the tram flap, we take the lower part of the abdomen, and we keep that attached to one of the rectus muscles. Then what we do is we make a tunnel all the way up. We bring it out through the mastectomy site. And it's the skin and the fat from down here that make the breast. People, when they look at you, expect to see you look a certain way. I've always been not an overly active person, but I enjoy swimming and I enjoy, in the summer, um, you know, walking around a little more natural than wearing a prosthesis and having talked to women who have had it done and are extremely happy that it's been done. That helped to solidify my decision. First incision of the bilateral tram flap. Patients that choose this procedure prefer using their own tissue over a prosthetic material such as saline filled implants. If you've had a, a number of uh, children, uh, women are quite happy to reinvest that tissue uh, somewhere else. She gets a breast back and uh, also gets a tummy tuck at the same time. One of the fascinating things about surgery I find is that it totally absorbs you and I think it takes a 150 percent of your concentration. I still find every day in the operating room fascinating. And surgery is the, the best part of my week. You know, nobody's phoning you. You're focusing on what you do and it's a, a combination of intellectual and, and, um, and using your hands.
what we're going to do uh, next is uh, the uh, the two breast areas. This is where she just had her mastectomy. This is the opposite side where she all, uh, had her mastectomy previously, and we've just recreated the same type of pocket as we have here. And uh, in the lower abdomen here, we have uh, the area that would normally be discarded after a tummy tuck. And if we uh, can see that this area of skin and fat is now attached to this muscle, the muscle is freed up, and uh, we're going to pass this through. I'll show you how we do this. And this is the, the magical part of this procedure, where we flip it through like that. So it's now, the muscle is turned over on itself. And uh, we'll just staple this in a position here. So I'll take one of these things. You can see how this is uh, fitting into position here. So we're going to transfer the, the second one up here now. This is the left breast coming up through the tunnel. The size of the breast is really dependent on the amount of tissue that the patient has to donate from down below. What we're doing here is uh, taking the first layer of the skin off the upper part of the flap so it can tuck up underneath uh, towards the, the collarbone and uh, this will provide a, a much more natural shape to the breast. And uh, the, the great thing about this particular procedure is that the longer the patient has it, the more it seems to remodel itself. Uh, if the patient puts on weight, it puts on weight. If she loses weight, it also loses weight. What I'm doing here is taking uh, a portion of proline mesh, which is uh, a special woven suture, which we use to repair part of the abdominal wall that we've taken some tissue from. We leave the belly button where it is. It's like having a, a girdle inside uh, the tissues and uh, stays in there permanently. We put in uh, two layers of, of absorbable sutures. These are all biodegradable. And uh, so you don't see really anything on the outside. And it takes a bit longer to, uh, to do it this way, but it, we feel it gives them a superior result. The belly button is in its uh, right position, and we've just brought it out through the, uh, the skin flap here. The nipples, uh, we don't do right away because uh, it's difficult to know exactly where they should go when they're still swelling. And uh, so we usually do the nipple reconstruction at uh, three to four months down the road. So I'm actually very pleased with this. I, I think she'll have a good result. And uh, the procedure went uh, very well from one end to the other. Hi. Nice to, well, it's nice to meet you. Uh, everything went fine. Uh, uh, no problems. Went uh, very smoothly. She's just, uh, just putting the bandages on now. She'll end up in the recovery room. It went very smoothly. She didn't lose a lot of blood or anything like that. So, and it looks good. We're happy with the way it looks. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. All right. Thanks very much. All right. Bye bye now. Bye bye. Absolutely. Let's, uh, I'm just going to have a quick peek at you, if yeah. that's okay. Yeah. Um, no. Joanne has uh, actually done very well. The incisions look great. Uh, she's wearing her abdominal binder to give her some support there where we took the tissue from. So I think she's doing very well. So she should do fine. But these, this looks great. Looks really good. Now, as far as the drainage just came out of the, the yeah. abdomen, so yeah. if it's, there's, will that fill up with fluid at all, do you think? No, not know? as long as you're wearing your binder. If you wear your binder, okay. keep that nicely okay. uh, snug, uh, night and day, 24-7. He was concerned and... Uh, 
Uh, I like how he described everything. It was very matter of fact, didn't sugarcoat anything, and uh, he could answer any question I had. Um, and I liked him. You know, we joke about things like, well, when you do a sit-up, well, you feel it up here. You know, like your, your stomach muscles are up here now. And uh, uh, so it's, it, you know, you, yeah. I'm very pleased. I'm very pleased. And uh, with every day, I feel stronger. When you have a diagnosis of cancer, it's always there. It's always in the back of your mind. But as people get farther from that event, there are gaps when you don't think about it. And what women tell me is that with the reconstruction, those gaps are longer and longer. They're not always reminded when they look in the mirror that in fact, you know, I, I have got cancer. They, they seem to leapfrog past that. And uh, it gives them a better sense of well-being and getting back to their activities of a normal life. I think the bottom line is you have to like looking after people. Uh, the patient is number one. You can't lose focus if that's why you're there, that's who you're helping. And that's where your, all your efforts should be concentrated. It's helping the patients out and when they're in, in a time of trouble is, uh, is a great, it's a great uh, privilege to be able to be involved in somebody's life like that, I think.